Hello, welcome to today's episode of Juice the Numbers, your statistics and sports podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Tracy. And I'm Corwin Eller. The other of the two hosts. That's, That's right. True. He's the he's the juice and the juicing the numbers. If one of us was to be the juice, do you think it would be you? Or do you think it would be me? Who's got the juice? You you absolutely have the juice. So does that mean that you're the numbers? Um no, because this isn't a porno where you're like ramming me in the ass the whole time. Um, I feel like, if anything, I'm the guy holding the camera of the porno of the two of us. So it's still a porno of the two of us. <laughs> but not only are you getting uh, fucked, you're also recording it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, this analogy got weird very fast because I didn't even make this a porno reference at all. No, I that was we are we are two minutes into recording and you've already made several references to me fucking you. (laughs) Oh boy, it's a slow day, man. So first first things first, we're coming at everybody late. Uh, we're recording this on Monday. Usually this drops on Monday, so it's gonna be dropping. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. Um, but typically we're 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 Day late because of uh, Mother's Day has been time with our Madres. They deserved it. Um, so, we're, you know, that's already thrown us off. And then as Corin and I were just talking about heading into this, ain't shit really going on at all. Football is rather quiet from all things that uh, I can tell or that I think that the, the two of us can tell. Um and, uh, you know, which leaves really just playoff hockey going, which is going. First round is still underway. Um, no sweeps, nothing. So, you know, we're just kind of standing pat waiting for hockey to give us a development for one of our two teams or whatnot. Um, and that really just leaves baseball, which is just kind of chugging, chug, chug, chugging along. So, uh Hey. Want to talk some baseball? Yes. Yes. Oh, God, I have not watched enough baseball. And it's a shame uh, because it's been it's been interesting for the teams that we care about. Um, Mm -hmm. As so far, the two winningest cities in the MLB or in MLB have been uh, the New York and L.A. teams, New York, uh, the Mets and the Yankees are both on top of their divisions. Both teams have 20 wins as of recording this right now. And in L.A., both teams have 19 wins and are leading their divisions. And between those four teams, we have the four best records between the AL and the NL. Which is interesting shit. Um, the Yankees and Dodgers are obviously relatively unsurprising. Corwin, did you have your hand up? Um. I was going to ask a question if we were going to dive into those top teams, but I will hold off if you still have more. No, go ahead. Uh, Can you just, uh, can you, from the perspective of a Yankees fan, give me not necessarily the cliff notes, but like the, if they were to make a dramatic film about this player, you know how you need to spruce it up and make it seem super heroic. Can you tell me about the season of Nestor Cortez Jr.? I mean, it goes beyond words. A la folk hero, Nestor Cortez Jr. It goes beyond word. 36th round draft. A round I don't think still exists anymore in the MLB draft. Um, who was playing like winter ball, I think, up until this year just to make ends meet financially or maybe it was last winter, and has been a force. Was a Yankee, I mean, was like an Oriole and like a bunch of other teams, was a Yankee, wow. got, got rule five by the Yankees, got cut, and then got brought back to the Yankees after he got cut, and has been a tour de force ever since. Corwin Heller. Uh, We just did the NFL draft. There's like 262 players drafted in the NFL draft. Uh, For reference, Nestor Cortez Jr. was the 1,094th player selected in the draft in 2013. 
over a thousand players. Yeah. I mean, it's nuts. And like you look at his um his regular season pitching 2018 with the Orioles, 2019 with the Yankees, 2020 with Seattle, and then 2021 and 2022 back with the Yankees. And his ERA in that time in 2018, it was uh, 7.71 in four innings. So four and two thirds, nothing. Then he came to the Yankees, 66 innings. He got uh, an ERA of 5.67. So a, a marketed improvement, but, but still not good. With the Mariners in a in a COVID shortened season, 7.2 innings, an ERA of 15.26. So that's really bad. And so the Yankees decided to take a flyer on him. And then with a bunch of injuries in 2021, he ends up pitching a pretty significant amount, 93 innings, 2.9 ERA. And so far this year, in five games, he's pitched 24.2 innings. And this number is about to go down because he just pitched again today. And baseball reference hasn't updated yet. Uh, a 1.82 ERA. And with no runs allowed in this game that he just pitched with 7.1 innings, I don't feel like Do doing the math. math. Do but the math. It's like my Do balls. The math. But that ERA many, is going to go innings, down. How many innings did he pitch today? 7.1. Okay. So that is 31.3 divided by. That wouldn't be 31.3. It would be, it would be, it would be 32. You dumb fuck. Oh my God. <laughs> that, that, that's where we're at folks. <sighs> yeah. Woo-hoo. Um, uh, oh, shit. Um, I forget how to do it. Uh, all right, fine. I'll do it. It's, Divided um, by three times nine. No, no. it's uh, no. five, which is his current um, times um, nine divided by 4.2 to get his current ERA. Ooh, no, that's wrong. So I did something wrong, too. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Wait, Nine I know how to do this. Times earned runs. Wait, this is what I just did. How did that work then? Oh, I did. Oh, I'm a dumb fuck. I, I did his. I did his regular runs, not his earned runs. Okay, okay. All 1. right. Uh, twenty four point six seven. Yeah. Okay. So, um, divided by thirty two. Yeah. All right. We well, yeah, have one point four one. There we go. Wow. Oof. And it's it's like holy shit that took us so long. <laughs> it's not it's not good. I'll tell you that. And if we look at the uh, the MLB pitching leaders so far this year, the ERA the current ERA leader in, in all of MLB is um uh, Zach Gallen. <laughs> what um, with a zero nine five. The number ten guy is Clayton Kershaw at one point eight, which is as far back as as the list I'm looking at very lazily goes. So one point four would rocket him up to uh, fifth in MLB, just behind Zach Gallon, number one, um, Pablo Lopez of the Marlins at number two, Merrill, Merrill Kelly also of the Diamondbacks at number three, and then Logan That's... Gilbert of Seattle at number four. I know, I'm shocked at these names. It's a hilarious list of names. Man, the Diamondbacks, we have to talk about them at some point. No, we and so it's um, it's just a wild season because even like, as weird as it is to see a guy like Zach Gallen be here, like he's been a guy for a while, you know, like he's not necessarily lived up to the entirety of what I think he, they needed him to be all the time, but he has a career ERA of 3.22 and over 300 career innings pitched. Whereas today, um, Nestor Cortez hasn't pitched over actually today. He just pitched his 200th inning as a major league baseball player. So like, I, I mean, Zach Gallon, while it's still wacky to see his name at the top of the list has over a hundred more innings pitched than Nestor Cortez, who really started starting out of sheer necessity from the Yankees. He was a bullpen arm that just kept doing so fucking well when he got um, additional exposure that they just turned him into a starter Two great success so far. I mean, it's been astonishing. Mm-hmm. I actively want the Yankees to do well, but never be the best. I hate when the Yankees are the best, well, but I want Nestor Cortez to be a fucking Cy Young runaway this year. I want him to succeed so badly. 
I genuinely, genuinely don't think I would like him nearly as much if he didn't have that gorgeous mustache that just fits his character so well. Fucking Mario ass mustache. <laughs> it's ridiculous how much I love that mustache on him. Um, but yeah, he's he is so much fun. Do you know what percentile his fastball velocity is? No. Fourth. Hmm. That means that he throws his fastball oh hmm. in the top or I guess in the, the bottom there, 4% of the entire fucking league. 96, 96% of baseball players throw their fastball faster than him. It, it, it's, it's insane. And what even is his, his velocity. Wrist, uh, his, let's see if I can find his velocity for you. Um, I have exit velocity and max exit velocity, but do I have his average pitch velocity? That's the question. Fan tracks might have that. Um, fan graphs should. I have usage. I know, I know it's on here somewhere, but while I'm looking for, oh, uh, all right, miles per hour, uh, 90.2 average forcing fastball, 90.2. Um, yeah, and if you combine that with the other fastball that he throws, which is his cutter, his cutter is thrown at an average of 85.7 miles per hour. His slider is thrown at an average of 76.3 miles per hour, changeup at 83, and sinker at 90.6. Um, and it's hilarious because if you look at the the movement that he gets, a lot of it is really quite bad. Um, his his um, sinker usage versus average is, is terrible. He gets 9.7 fewer inches of vertical movement and 5.2 fewer inches of horizontal movement on his sinker compared to league average, which is really quite, quite bad. Um, and he also doesn't get nearly as much horizontal movement on his four seamer um, or as much vertical movement on his slider as league average. He makes up, he has some additional vertical movement on his four seamer. Um, and there's some good areas in, in these pitches as well that obviously make up the difference, but it's such an interesting case in, you, it's really not on the stat sheet where his success is. Because, like, you know, his fastball velocity is very low, so you might say, oh, he's got really tricky stuff. But his whiff rate also isn't very high either. His whiff rate, um, he's in the 34th percentile in whiff rate. So that's obviously, like, I mean, it's not horrible, but it's it's really not good. Um, and when he gets touched up, he gets touched up, average exit velocity in the 46th percentile. But then you look at everything else, it's all fantastic. His expected yeah. ERA, 89th percentile. Expected Woba, 89th percentile. Expected slugging, 84th. Strikeout percent, 86th. Expected batting, 90th percentile. It comes down to the wacky shit with his timing, which is you, which you can't put on. A, on uh, I don't know how you would account for it on a, a stat sheet like this and is the, what makes him his player. Is what Do you have his ground ball rates in front of you? Uh, yeah. Is it abnormally high? Like, is this a love child of uh, Johnny Cueto and Dallas Keuchel? Um, his ground ball rate is thirty five point wow. six. For a reference point, give me give me another player. Give me another pitcher we want to compare him to. Uh, Dallas Keuchel. Fair enough. All right. Oop, that's not how you spell Dallas. Dalala. All right, Dallas Keuchel. Where do you see ground ball? Oh, the in season projections. I don't want projections. Yeah, I'm in a baseball savant. 36.6. Got it. I I enjoy intentionally mispronouncing words, but it's it, it becomes unfortunate when people think I'm being serious. Um but you convince. said mispronouncing. <laughs> yeah. Like, come um, on. Then people think I'm being serious and I'm not. Um Dallas Keuchel's ground ball percent is 56.1 this year. I, and Mr. Cortez okay. again, 33, like right. 35.6, like way lower. Uh, okay. I, I don't know how to just explain it then. Like every number points to good, except for the numbers about him throwing a baseball. Like the expectations, the projections are all like, yeah, this guy's great. But here's the results. And it's like, well, I don't 
actually know how any of this adds up. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting profile to look at because so with Dallas Keuchel as our comp, fifty six percent of the time it's a ground ball, fourteen point six percent of the time it's a fly ball, um, and then line drives twenty five point six percent of the time and uh, PU, which I assume is pop up <laughs> PU um, three point seven percent of the time, and for Nestor Cortez it's a little bit more evenly distributed, but so all right so. Ground ball, 35.6. Fly ball, 30.5. So that fly ball is also double Dallas Keuchel's. So both of those would read not what you want. You would want a lot of ground balls and not a lot of fly balls because fly balls turn into home runs. Um, line drive percent is basically the same, 25 and change for each. Pop-ups way higher, double, more than double for Nestor Cortez, 8.5%. And what's interesting is a look at the pull percents or like the directional batting because Dallas Keiko throwing so much slow stuff. It ends up getting pulled a lot more frequently, 45% of the time um, to Nestor Cortez is 35 straight away. Nestor Cortez, 10 points higher than Keiko, 42% of the time for Cortez. And then opposite field is exactly the same. And it, it's tough to even get a read on that. Cause you would look at those types of numbers and go, all right. So Dallas Keiko is putting the ball on the ground not putting the ball in the air. And when the ball is in play, it is most frequently going towards, in all likelihood, the best defensive part of the infield, third and short. And yet, I I mean, Dallas Keuchel's current sliders look terrible. I mean, he is in the bottom 50 percentile in everything except hard hit rate percent and average exit velocity. And it shows in his actual stats as well. His ERA so far this season, 6.86. And so it's like, yeah, maybe some of this is the Yankees have better infield defense than the White Sox do this season. Maybe that's some of it. But it's also just so weird because it's like you can't, I can't get a good, if, if I didn't see the actual, results for like the sliders, um, the percentile ranks and, and the uh, non-expected stats, the, the actual stats, I would assume that Nestor Cortez was bad or at least not achieving what he was trying to, because even if we look at uh, more of the batted ball profi- profile, Dallas Keuchel has a higher weak contact percent that he has a higher topped ball percent Um a lower under percent, so, so again, fewer uh, fly balls, a higher flare burner percent. He has a way lower solid contact percent, uh, a lower barreled ball, actually a slightly higher barrel ball percent, um, and a slightly higher barrels per plate appearance, but not by a significant amount, about two percentage points. And so it, I would expect from all that, Dallas Keiko to be the better player, and Nestor Cortez is running circles around him. It's one of those things where I just realized I said it's one of those things and that's my catchphrase and I hate how often I say it. But if I was a gambler or if I was a fantasy manager still and I had Nestor Cortez on my team and I wasn't a Yankees fan and I wasn't watching him pitch games, I would look at these numbers and be like, holy shit, I got to sell this guy for a fucking sack of potatoes and a bag of rice. Like I... This guy's going to implode any minute, and I need to get off this train while the iron's hot. Um, but I have watched him pitch, and I, having watched him pitch, if I didn't own him, I would trade a king's ransom for him just because I want to be able to fucking root for this guy every time he steps up on the mound. He's he's just the fucking man. He's a Yankees player that I really love to watch play, and that dude's fucking that's tremendous. Tough. Absolutely tremendous. And what a, and just again, what a ride it's been to get here. So just starting with when he debuted in the majors in 2018 with the Orioles. So ignoring everything prior to that, um, he's spent parts of 2018 in double uh, a and FGW. Which I don't even know what that is. Fall 
and Winter League, maybe? FGW. I don't even know what FGW would possibly stand for. Fall Guatemalan Winter League. No idea. Good as guess is the, the one I've got. With um, the Estrellas? Dominican, yeah, Dominican Winter League. It's the Dominican Winter League. Um, 2019 played winter ball again with two different teams from 2018 to 2019. Triple A with the Yankees. Um, and then he went back to then he went to the uh, to Seattle for a, a stint, back to Dominican Winter Ball, triple A with the Yankees in 2021, and then actually started the season with the Yankees in 2022. But I, I mean, like like there hasn't been a, a winter where he hasn't played winter ball since actually, yeah, this past winter was the first year he didn't do it. Like that's nuts. Do you like watching him more than you like watching Garrett Cole? Absolutely. This is not a question about who's better, which is honestly a debate at this present point in time. It's not a question about who's better because that's the thing that has made Nestor Cortez's bag of trickery so much fun is that one, it's effective, but two, it's so variant and it's so much unlike we get phases of it or like glimpses of it in other players, you know, like Clayton Kershaw has his very patented bottom foot pause, you know, where he like lifts up the leg, puts it almost to the ground and then hikes it up and throws. Right. And there's an element of fucking with timing in that basic moment motion, even if it held the same every time. And he varies a little bit, how long he holds that down for or how aggressively he hikes up his leg. So some variation there. Marcus Stroman also has some small variations in his pitch tempo. Johnny Cueto is a huge exam- example of, you know, with the shimmy, like his pitch tempo change. Johnny Cueto is the example. <laughs> yeah. But what I'm saying is like you see bits of it in other places, but Nestor Cortez is, is so radical not just in the tempo part of it, but also the style of delivery that he is throwing out there. Like there's, he changes his arm slot as well to accommodate a more confusing perspective to add in. Like it's a guy that's managed to overcome only throwing a 90 mile an hour fastball or a 92 mile an hour fastball. It's such an interesting way. Like it's what I think you or I would be say to a guy, you know what I mean? We'll be like, what? Just throw it more differently. Just mm-hmm. throw it even more differenter. And then they won't know where it's cut. Like two idiots who don't know baseball good enough. It feels like advice we would give that Nestor Cortez is like, I got you. I got you. I know what you're saying. And then we like, just do it. You watch Jacob DeGrom pitch and how every single pitch comes from the exact, exact like the same. utter exact same tunnel. His overlays don't look like overlays. <laughs> Right. It just looks like one singular pitch. And like, it's funny how I am into golf. That should have come across on this podcast by now. Um, I am working dresses, folks. diligently. Exactly. I'm working diligently to just figure out how to make it. So I just swing the same every time because consistency is literally everything. And for baseball, it's just like, yeah, if you are so consistent, uh, if you don't have the utter athletic marvel of some like someone like Jacob deGrom you will be just ripped to shreds it's like this huge detriment to your game and it's just compare and contrast to very different sports with very different goals but again it's like You know, we hear a lot about how in the past couple of seasons, like like the the Rays have a stable of guys in the bullpen who all throw out of different arm slots, you know, and you've seen a lot of like graphics of Rays pitchers in their motions um, all overlaid over like a clock. So you can really see like where all of their release points are. And the idea of having guys that not only throw certain pitches or again a specific handedness for a situation but also have different release points is that constantly changing release points 
with different pitchers makes it more difficult for batters to get comfortable. And we are, I think, just really getting to it. It feels he feels so beyond where we are right now. It feels like that understanding is really just being grasped or, or uh, implemented, I should say, not grasped, implemented in, in teams for an entire bullpen. And here's a guy who's like, I'm just going to do it all myself. Why do we need three guys? I'll just be all three guys. And it's like, yeah, he got it. Like that, he nailed it. And that's the thing that's so wild to see is like, he's an experiment that is of his own creation, really. And I think that's what, because you know, it's like, everyone is trying to throw harder. And it's not bad. Like throwing harder achieves ideally better mechanics. It is it, the ability to throw harder is the ability to refine your mechanics to a better point of perfection, right? You can't throw harder by brute force. You have to throw harder by having really good form and technique. You can't just muscle a ball out there. That's the point. Corin and I could, could do strength training for like the next year and still not throw a ball 90 miles an hour. You have to know how to throw a baseball to throw it hard. Whereas it feels as though at some point in Nestor Cortez's career, he either got told or realized himself, you are never going to throw 97 miles an hour. So don't fucking try. Find a different way to be effective. And found it five times over. It's just so interesting to see. You know, it feels like um. I want to do this. I want to just oh, do uh, weight training for six months and see if we could actually throw a baseball ninety miles an hour. And that's the thing. We, we, we never. There's no way. It's like um. It's like you ever like watch like some of the uh, the the field events in the Olympics, like the discus or the um the shot put, and they do like that huge, big, goofy wind up thing where they spin around in a bunch of circles and they, mm-hmm. they have like the shot put like tucked into. They're mm-hmm. like shoulder and neck, and it looks so brutally uncomfortable. But they do that because that's the most effective way to throw far. Like if you gave a really jacked guy a shot put and told him to throw it as far as he could like a baseball, and then you gave a guy significantly smaller than him a shot put who knew how to throw a shot put, that kid's going to throw it farther than the jacked guy 10 times out of 10. Because it's about technique and form. You know what I'm saying? It's why, like, you could get, you could pull the single strongest athlete baseball player, you know, out of your local gym and put him on a golf course next to 65-year-old Freddie Couples, give him five balls, and Freddie Couples is going to consistently outdrive him. Yeah, like Mitch. Mitch outdrives me. Mitch is built like a fucking twig. Yeah, same with you. Or it's like, you ever seen videos of like super jack dudes trying to arm wrestle, arm wrestling champions? Yep. Who are like it's, so are much just, less like jacked yeah. than they are. Yeah. It's the technique and like, I guess in that case, it's just a very focused strength. But regardless. Right. And, and it, there's a reason that that is, it's a good trajectory to have. But it's also so interesting because when we usually hear about pitchers who have uh, taken a step forward, whether it's pitchers that we're very familiar with who increasingly get better. Like that guy who signed with the Rays, whose name I can't, uh, not the Rays, uh, Blue Jays. I can't think of his name. Robbie he was on the Giants last year. Oh, oh um, Kevin Gaussman. Gaussman. And usually it ties into something like, how's he doing it? He's throwing the ball harder. I don't know if Gaussman specifically is, but usually when you hear something like, Jacob DeGron got better. How? He throws his fastball 99 now instead of 98. Um, and that's, I think very much so what we're accustomed to. It's like the guy is throwing harder and look at that. He's also better. And it feels like Nestor Cortez. It's more like he's not throwing the ball any harder. It might be softer, but boy, howdy is he crafting such an interesting dynamic, such an interesting dynamic, as opposed to what we're used to getting. I feel Baseball. like this is the future of knuckleball pitchers. Because really? you used to have guys like Phil Necro, 
who would pitch for, you know, 20 years uh, and surviving off the knuckleball because it was a pitch you didn't have to throw very hard. Mm-hmm. And if you uh, were, were good and had, you know, as good command as you can have with the knuckleball and were able to mix your repertoire enough, you could survive on throwing a ball 55 miles an hour and just having it be kind of wacky and erratic. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is going to become that where you can get away with throwing the ball somewhere between 75 and 90 miles per hour, you know, not hard, but being so variant in how you do it, then instead of the unpredictability and erraticism coming from the ball, like with a knuckleballer, it can instead come from your presentation of it. I mean, really, if, if there is the ability to really latch on to what Cortez is doing. I don't want to overstay it too much because we have no idea. It's one guy, but it could be a way to genuinely extend careers. Imagine if Tim Lincecum could learn to do that instead of uh, just trying to chuck the ball super hard. Uh, easier said than done, but I mean, damn. I mean, his whole career was ended because he had to extend himself and his legs further down the mound to gain velocity. If he could have achieved that same velocity gain through other methods, maybe we'd still have Tim Lynch come pitching with us. Yeah. I mean, like could even imagine because it's been like a decade since he retired. It's got to It's got to be like eight years. Yeah. Like what? 2013, 2015. I don't. Was he on the 2014 Giants team? That's the one I'm not sure of. Tim Lynch, come. Unfortunate was name. when he officially retired, apparently, but he last pitched for the Giants in 2015. So, yeah, OK, he was on the 2014 mm-hmm. Giants team. But oh, my God, his ERA from 2012 on was so bad. Yeah, it was. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Thanks. But like, you know, we even see it to a certain extent with what um, Zach Greinke is doing. Three straight Zach Greinke, years leading honestly, the league in strikeouts. Zach Greinke never a guy who threw super <sighs> duper hard, but even um, even the, the things that he does with his timing and his like throwing a fastball slower than he throws a change up, you know, like that kind of weird shit probably extended his career a good like four or five years because he did not rely on velocity had really great command, but also did some weird variation stuff. And Nestor Cortez, what he's doing feels like the next step in the evolution of that, it, you know, it really being able to tack on a couple years in that way. Interesting, interesting shit. Hell yeah. Should we talk about a different picture? I actually would like to, to, um, Speaking of Mitch, I got into a debate with Mitch uh, when I went golfing with him the other day about who nice. the best player Thanks on the Mets is. It was Ooh. down in Maryland for Greg's bachelor for Greg's Ooh. baby shower. Like I kind of fit. I kind of figured. Yeah. <laughs> um, the best player on the Mets because like, overall or actively right now. So, so Mitch said the Mets are doing so well, and our best pitcher isn't even playing yet. And I said, Mitch, your best player, your best pitcher is playing right now. And this started a debate. And I would like to hear your opinion on who the best pitcher on the Mets is. Currently, like this year, 2022, at the end of the year, who will have better numbers will be Jacob DeGrom. I think the career of Max Scherzer currently outweighs the full career of Jacob DeGrom. But you know, if both were healthy right now, I would say Jacob DeGrom is the better pitcher. But that's where my argument came in, which is the best player on your team is the best quality player who actually plays the game. And yeah, if Jacob, Jacob DeGrom, DeGrom misses hasn't... three months of the season and Max Scherzer doesn't, unless either Scherzer plays super poorly or super below his own standards, or DeGrom plays well above his own stupid high standards, there's no way he's catching up from even just a war perspective to where Scherz is going to be by season end. And your best players, the guy on the field. 
know what I'm saying? I very much understand the premise of the best ability is availability. But the, I don't think Jacob deGrom is a case of literally never fucking healthy. Like, who's the best player on the Twins right now? The best player on the Twins? Uh, By- Byron Buxton. Who's never healthy and is in a healthy stretch for the first time in his career. But there's still absolutely no doubt he's the best player on the Twins, even though there's other guys on the team who are relatively good. Um, Sorry, do you know what Byron Buxton's OPS is for this season so far? Oh, uh, like 1,300. Oh, sorry, his OPS plus. 1,300. <laughs> uh, 189. 215. Oh, I guess so high. Oh. It's even higher. Oh, uh, my God. It's so fucking great. I love it so much. Give me give me his game totals for the last five years. Byron Buxton? Yeah. Okay. For just the last five seasons, including this one. You can exclude um, this one, but. I, I mean, I already did the thing, so now it's including this one. Slash line of 263, 308, 546. That's an OPS of 854, an OPS plus of 129. He has uh, 51 home runs, four triples, 65 doubles, 200 hit, 210 hits total, uh, 31 stolen bases to five cost stealing, 41 walks, 220 strikeouts. Game totals, though. Like, how how often has he played the game? Oh, game totals. Uh, I see. I see the mix up, but yes, the games he has played. Uh, this season so far, he's played in 19 games, which he missed a few. The Seems twins altogether have 29 relatively. games, so he missed 10, the minimum wow. you could miss for an all uh, for an IL stint. Uh, last season, he played 61 games. The season before that was the shortened season, so he played 39 games, but that tracks still like half uh, the season. 2019, he played in 87 games, and in 2018, he played in 20, uh, 28 games. He has eclipsed 100 games played a numbers. single time. That's really bad. I didn't think it was going to be that bad, oh, it's, but it's, it's, yeah, it's really very, very disgusting. Yeah. Um, man, ultimate what if player right now. Like, what if he is healthy? It's almost like a shoe in for MVP. In the last uh, four seasons, including this season, who has more war, Jacob Degrom or Max Scherzer? More war, Jacob. So Degrom I'm taking Jacob Degrom. Scherzer. His career obviously is very skewed. I'm taking Jacob Degrom, um, or since 2018, which is Jacob Degrom's first of the back-to-back Cy Young seasons. So this is peak Jacob Degrom uh, versus the age 33 through 37 seasons of Max Scherzer. Um. Who has more war? Uh, I I'll go Jacob Degrom, but I feel like the recency bias of Degrom probably would give Scherzer a good chance. It is Degrom. Degrom has twenty three point seven baseball reference war in that time. Max Scherzer has twenty two point two, so a one point five war difference. Over the last five seasons, six seasons of baseball. Which, which, when it comes down to it, like what point three a season is negligible. When Highly negligible. War. Which yeah. again, and that's over the best Jacob Degrom seasons. His his two back to back Cy Youngs and his third place Cy Young finish, and it's not. It doesn't capture a single Cy Young season from Max Scherzer's career. Not a one. And I will say that we're you, talking you make, about Max Scherzer healthy and on the field with no injury. Cause that that's the thing that has me concerned about the Not that he has missed a ton of time because he hasn't missed a ton of time. He's, I mean, he didn't play a lot. He missed a lot of time these last two years, but like before that, not much, but the forward looking is it feels like every time he comes back, boom, there's a setback. That's my concern. Scherzer doesn't have that. I, the devil, 
at the devil's advocate in me will say, yes, we can look at value over the past five seasons, but the root of this argument is who is the better player right now? And I think if you were to look at healthy numbers for both of them right now, Jacob DeGrom would still have that edge. I'll say like, I'll say it again, like Max Scherzer has absolutely had the better career. He is an easy lock for hall of fame first ballot kind of guy. I don't think Jacob DeGrom is there yet for even in the conversation of hall of fame, uh, you know, on a consensus level, but uh, I will see to the fact that, yeah, like (laughs) it's hard to call someone who is currently injured and is missing a significant chunk of time. your actively best player. It's like, um, and it's the thing. This is why I thought it'd be an interesting conversation because as much as I will defend my perspective on it, I don't think there's a right answer to it. And to your point about the twins, let's look at this from a, a, a conversation I think is a little bit closer, which is let's say one of Mike Trout or Shohei Otani was hurt. Oh. And so the debate becomes suicide. Who is your best player? And for me, it'd be. Whichever one of them is on the field. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what well, this is. That's doing. such a great argument because it's like Shohei Otani is Mr. Do Everything at a very high level. Like Mike Trout is a better hitter and fielder than Shohei Otani, but he doesn't pitch a baseball, you know? Hey, it's so we haven't hard. pushed like, him to find out. <laughs> we haven't. You're not wrong. Oh, boy. I just went to put on baseball, and uh, the free game of the day is the Dodgers versus the Pirates. And as a former Pirates fan and current Dodgers hater, I just can't imagine a game that just would make me sadder. That's just a factory of sadness. What? Oh, my God. What do you think Shohei Otani and Mike Trout's wars are respectively so far this season Ooh. Um, i just saw it and it hurts oh no um I, mike trout's having a great season i'll say he has like a 1.3 1. 1.9 212 oh. oh oh dude it's an absolutely oh. insane season so far i love that so much that makes me so happy yeah. Uh, show high, I'll say, is like uh, a 1.1. 1. 1. 0. 0.8. He has a 104 OPS plus so far this season. What are his splits hitting and pitching? Um, so, again, 104 OPS plus for uh, pitching. He has a uh, 120 ERA plus. That's good. Yeah, so the pitching, the pitching great, is certainly there. But good, yeah. Yeah, it's the hitting that is um, in a skid at the moment. Yeah. Um, what? Mm. How many home runs does he have? Shohei Otani has six home runs. Okay. Oh, sorry, that's, that's Mike terrible. Trout. Um, Shohei Otani has four home runs. That's not nearly as good. He also has there. four stolen bases faith. to Mike Trout's zero stolen bases. Mike oh, Trout's well. not stealing any bases. He scored the game-winning run the other night, so I'll give him that. Mike Trout has 78 career war. I just He's can't so get over good. that fucking... But so that, but, but, and that's what I'm saying is, like, if Mike Trout was going to miss a half a season, like, if Mike Trout was going to miss a third of the year, let's say, yeah. or I mean, a quarter of the year. Uh-huh. Like a significant chunk of time. He was going to miss like a month, two months of baseball and show high was what he was last season, just so that we have a fair comparison. Cause I'm sure he'll pick it up, but so far he's not at last year's pace yet. Um, your best player is show high because he's playing. Yeah. You know, and granted, this is a, for all intents and purposes, this is a pretty good problem to have. Like, obviously the problem revolves around one of your players being hurt, but. We're not talking forever. We're talking future hypotheticals and can the value eventually amass enough to where it's, it's more of a 
debate on a, on a rate like basis, but it, it is still a good. Oh, we have too many superstars and we have to pick like, which one. It's a good problem to have. But yeah, the issue with the show high versus Mike Trout debate is like Mike Trout may very well be the best player to ever play baseball. And Shohei Otani, as a hitter last year, when he finally kind of broke out, bat at an MVP level and also had like a three dot, you know, a, a sub three five ERA on top of it, which is, it's not Cy Young level, it's not MVP level, but like you can be an all star with a three five ERA. Three one eight. Oh my God. Like, an all-star level pitcher plus an MVP level batter is stupid, even up against the best player in all of baseball. You know, what's hilarious that really just paint, paints a picture of the run environment thing that we were talking about the other day. Um, Cause obviously it would go the opposite way for pitchers. I didn't even think about it. So show how last year, uh, three eighteen ERA. So that was an ERA mm-hmm. plus of one forty. this season, an even lower ERA three Oh eight but his ERA plus is 20 points lower. It's 120 because there's just no scoring in the league. So even though his ERA got a 10th of a point better as respect in respect to the entire in perspective against the entire league, it got worse, which is just hilarious because baseball is so wonky that way. And really like usually it, you don't notice that much of a variance year over year when you're looking at a play player stat page, because there's very right. rarely that much fluctuation, but man, that those two numbers stick out as being mm-hmm. so crazy. Baseball's so fucking weird. I know there's a reason this is a sport that like nerds just blow their loads over. I love it so much. Um, yeah, Max Scherzer, right. a full war so far this season. Jacob DeGrom, none, dumb bitch. Nah, uh, he'll come back and be super good, and it'll be very annoying. Dumb bitch doesn't have any war. Fucking loser. You know, Nestor Cortez is more war than Jacob DeGrom. <laughs> Technically the truth. <laughs> literally the truth. Te- te- technically, literally the truth, yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, we talked about the Mets a little bit the other day. We talked about the Yankees already a lot. Let's talk about the uh, the Angels real quick, and then we'll probably end up getting out of here because there's no point talking about the Dodgers either. Um, Good. Fuck the Dodgers. The Angels lineup is hilarious because of where their production is coming from and to what extent. So taking it position by position, Max Stassi, a catcher, it's a fine hitting catcher. Uh, he's not yeah. great, but we've talked about in the past how the, the – um, the, the acceptability, like the <laughs> OPS plus of catchers needs to be looked at differently than the OPS plus of your average player. Max Sassy is the poster boy for acceptable. His 91 OPS plus, I bet if we looked at catchers across the league, looks amazing. Yeah, the POPS plus for him is probably through the roof. What do you think? Um, Pick a catcher who give me or give me a team anyway. Um the Padres. All right, let's look at the the San Diego Padres. All right, Campusano, Austin Nola, step up to the plate. What do you got? Austin Nola's OPS plus is sixty three. Wow, I'm funny. glad we traded All Star Ty France for this. <laughs> Luis Campusano, negative fifty one. Negative 50, negative 51. His OPS how many plus plate is appearances does he have? How many, 13. how many plate appearances? Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. Christ. Very, very small sample size. Um, yeah. Ma- so anyway, Max Stassi, 91 OPS plus. So like, all right, that's fine. Jared Walsh at first base with a 124 OPS plus having a great start to his season. Really, you know, he, he made such a, such an impression last year. Uh, it's good to see him staying you know to that level of production so that's that's great tyler wade is slotted in there at second yankees cast off uh 106 ops plus which is way more serviceable than he had been at any point in his career with the yanks so i guess good for him but you know not really saying making too much of a dent there andrew velasquez another yankees cast off 
OPS plus for the Angels? 17. 17. 131, 217, 164. OPS of 381. What's who is what's he batting in the order? Uh, I don't have his batting order here. I'm okay, going by position fair. group. Yeah, that would make but probably sense. dead last would be my guess. Um, the the shell Maybe. the husk yeah. of Anthony Rendon, um, batting a 105, OPS plus. Joe Adele, who's currently on the 40 man, so I guess this is really more like Brandon Marsh at this point, uh, who is batting a 125 OPS plus. And and Shohei Otani at the DH spot, who's batting a uh, 104 OPS plus, and all those guys are like good, you know. Jared Walsh, obviously the high water mark there, 124, and then it's like let's look at Mike Trout and and Taylor Ward just to just just to uh, see what they're doing. Ah, yes, yes, Mike Trout 212 and Taylor Ward 246. So good. center field and right field dragging this team forward with their hitting just unreal levels of production from these guys. Taylor Ward <sighs> has walked more and struck out less than Mike Trout. That's just, that's impressive. It's insane. It's insane. Is Taylor Ward the one that looks like a homeless person? They all do, but also yes. No. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, all right, so the Angels hitting is finally like, it feels like for so long, Patrick Sandoval, oh, I think Pablo Sandoval, all right. um, feels like the hitting for so long has had like these marquee names that have never performed up to what their, um, what, what their, their, their brand has gotten us accustomed to there. They never performed at the same time. Like they never lived up to their potential. And so here, you know, they're not firing on all cylinders. There's clear gaps there. And there's still guys that you'd like to see doing a little bit better than they currently are. Shohei Otani being one of those guys, Andrew Velasquez basically being an automatic out. Like those are problems, but by and large contributions are coming through where they need to come through. But let's look at the pitching real quick, because this is weird. So their most innings, that's how I'm going to start off here. Michael Lorenzen, uh, 4.13 ERA. Now, you know, career reliever for the most part, getting a lot more starting role here. Not going poorly, not going super well. Patrick Sandoval, 203 ERA, solid. Shai Otani, 308 ERA, solid. Noah Syndergaard, 263 ERA, solid. And it's like all three of those guys, great. So Michael Lorenzen, Eh, but two through four in innings pitched, really locking it down. And then after that, it's like, who is this? So you got Reed Dietmeyers and his 532 ERA, Jose Suarez and his 635 ERA, uh, and Mike, Mike Mayers and his 506 ERA. Like, so like spots five slash six in the rotation are pretty spotty so out of if we call it a six-man rotation three of them are like killing it and then three of them are very shaky and i i i don't know how that's going to hold for them going forward you know what i mean yeah uh and then i think a lot of it also comes down to health because i mean i think if you're a fan the top two guys there shohai otani and noah Syndergaard, are you know, the guys you expect to hold true throughout the course of a season, if they were to make it through a season healthy and neither of them has pitching the ball. Um, I don't know the last time Noah Syndergaard pitched a full season. Has he ever reached like 30 starts, 20 starts? Uh, Noah Syndergaard has only not made 30 starts in one Two, uh, three, four. All right. So actually, I know some girls kind of wacky rookie year, 24 starts. So for rookie year, yep. healthy, very solid 2016, uh, 30 starts. Great. Healthy. Yep. 2017, seven starts, not healthy. Bad. Very bad. Uh, then 2018, 25 starts, two complete games. I'd say that's healthy. 
2019, 32 starts. So again, a full season. And then since then, he has barely pitched. He did not pitch at all in 2020. Uh, he pitched two games in 21. And so far in 2022, he's pitched four games, which is he's been healthy so far to start. But um, in the two seasons prior, he has not been healthy. So in what should have been uh, two, four, six, eight MLB seasons, Who I guess. Who do we appreciate? Um, he has he has been healthy for half of them, which is honestly better than I remembered. But at the same time, an issue, especially for the Angels, where all of their pitchers are hurt all of the time, and where the depth is not proving to be there. That I think is going to be the 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 big issue. Obviously, depth anywhere is is tough to come by when it comes to pitching, but. It seems as though they have not asked very much of the outer parts of their bullpen. Um, and when they have, it's been to very mixed results. So their, their, their proper bullpen has been really quite good outside of Jimmy Herget and his 4.4 ERA. Everyone else is below a, a two five or below. Uh, but then once you get into like kind of those outer parts of your bullpen where if you get some stars that go down, you're going to be leaning on those guys a little bit more. It gets kind of dicey. Like Jaime Berea has been great with a one nine ERA, but Mike Mayers has been bad. Archie Bradley is now hurt and has been bad. Austin Warren is now hurt and has been mediocre. Andrew Watts has been bad. Elvis Puiguero has only pitched one inning. And a lot of these guys have pitched under 10 innings. So it's that dicey. It's been dicey. Whereas teams like the Dodgers, like the Yankees, um, it feels like the Mets kind of recently have been able to get role filler guys to just chew up some innings when a player is hurt or when they have to have an early exit, like when Garrett Cole can only make it through an inning and a third against Detroit, um, come in and do a role. Whereas that is, oh, wow, Corwin just became a bolt of white light. Um, whereas it feels like the Angels don't have that necessarily. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this holds. I don't think it will hold. I think it'll probably get overtaken by the Astros pretty soon, who are now nipping at the heels a half game back. But, uh, yeah. And, any... <laughs> I am, I'm, a, I'm a god. The Lord's light is shining down upon thee. Um, Good Lord is going down on me. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't think pitching is ever going to be something that is a all of a sudden just becomes a an area of depth for every team. Um, and <laughs> genuinely, <laughs> the Angels just kind of seem cursed in that regard. It's just well, been years upon years of just they've never had anyone or any depth or anything like it's been a skeleton graveyard um, for years. As opposed to all those uh, fleshy graveyards. Yeah. Uh, yep, yeah. Yep. 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 Um, yeah. And, and it feels like this. That's what was being highlighted more and more with teams, you know, like the Rays or um, like, like with Cleveland up until this season, um, which is being able to develop guys seemingly kind of quick that can come up and help you for at least a little while. Uh, what were you going to say? I mean, I think this is the exact reason we saw them pick 20 pitchers out of yeah. their 20 picks in the draft last year. Still got to change over that, uh, that development staff though. That's going to be the other big part of it. That's going to be huge. Yeah. And I, I have little faith in their, you know, health and what would you call their trainers um their Sadists. trainers yeah i guess yeah. Uh, misogynists um but i did see a post about how they've been performing in the minors this season and it's very good all right well uh hey we're gonna leave it there it's been a relatively quiet week and Corey and i have other things to do so we're just gonna kind of wrap it up unceremoniously uh yeah, yeah. fuck you guys Lick, lick, lick my balls. So, uh, hey, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Choosing Pod. If you'd like to follow Corbin on Twitter, you can do so at Corbin Heller. If you follow myself on Twitter, you, you can do so at Joshua D. Tracy. 
Uh, if you'd like to send emails for the show, you can do so at no juicing the numbers at gmail.com. And until Thursday, you all have a good one. Bye.